by 2000, we were about a $500 million company six months later. Fortunately, we sold it back to GE. Um, then I went off, was the fourth employee at Friendster, the first social network. Does anyone remember Friendster? Yeah, yeah all right. Um, so uh, lots of lessons learned there. I have actually a white paper on the 10 things that Friendster unfortunately did wrong and that Facebook did right, and that's why Facebook was so successful. Um, and then, uh, but fortunately I left to help start a company called Bebo, and we sold that to uh, AOL about three years later in 2008 for almost a billion dollars, so it was my second unicorn. And then I uh, left to uh, work at a venture firm for a year as an entrepreneur in residence and learned the venture industry and became an angel investor, and I did angel investing for five years. Uh, and I invested in two companies a year, and several of those companies have already been acquired. About six of them have, have been acquired. Uh, the largest acquisition was last year uh, Intuit bought a company I helped start called Check for almost $400 million. And then I have an investment. I was one of the first investors and actually the first acting COO for a company called Tango. Does anyone know Tango? It's a mobile messaging app. Yeah, with about 400 million uh, people who have used or are using the app. Um, and we just recently uh, had an uh, acquisition, but an investment from Alibaba, which uh, valued the company at uh, $1.5 billion. So I have some credibility, kind of uh, look back at my 20 years of doing this and thought, well, what are the things that I have saw that were patterns of the companies that have been successful? And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'll tell you a little bit about Maven. Uh, two years ago, we um, started Maven Ventures, uh, which is a venture fund. We invest in about 15 companies a year. Uh, we'll, in this uh, first fund, it's a micro VC fund. Um, out of those 15 companies, about five will be in our incubator. And I want to introduce you to my colleague, Sarah Thomas, who is standing up. Um, she runs our incubator um, and uh, will be here with me after if you guys want to chat with us about our incubator or our venture fund. Uh, you can see some of the portfolio companies in, uh, that we've invested in at Maven. So the first thing that we always talk about, and this is really one of the things that we're very passionate about, is you know, what is your vision worth fighting for? Okay? And you, know, you, really, you have to have a big idea if you want to build a billion dollar business. Um, it's something that you're not, you know, hopefully, ideally, that you're credible in being able to accomplish that. Maybe your background is in that space or, or you've seen the problem because it's a problem that you're personally having. So we're, we look for, is this a big vision? Is this a big vision worth fighting for? We only choose 15 companies out of the 2,500 companies we meet every year. Uh, so there are certain filters that have to reach to that level. And it's something that are we proud of bringing to the world. We see a lot of great companies that we don't actually want to help necessarily uh, you know, achieve their goal. It doesn't mean it's not going to be a great business or great outcome. It's just not something we're personally you know, interested in. So you know, are you credible? Are you passionate about it? Is this a big market opportunity? Are you solving a problem that consumers need, that tens of millions or hundreds of millions of consumers need? Those filters most people think about. There's one other filter that most people don't think about, which is, you know, is this being solved already? So a lot of people want to uh, try and solve a problem, but frankly, you know, uh, I don't want to pick on, like Craigslist we often pick on, but you know, Craigslist is solving a problem for hundreds of millions of people. It's really going to be hard to disrupt that business or Yelp. These, these companies, you know, it's a public company, they've got a great brand. Sure, there's things you can do to improve it, but that's a really hard business to go after. We, we actually love looking for like new ideas, you know. When Snapchat was born and pivoted into the, the new idea, they actually solved a problem that people didn't even know, that, especially the young adults, didn't even know that they had. Right? The way that young adults were communicating were with text messages, and those lasted forever. Right? That's, that's a problem, because you know, why should your communications with friends last forever? So Snapchat's idea of disappearing text messages and actually an, an even bigger idea of you know, using photos to do that, that, that go away, created this new way to communicate. And that's really interesting, right? So we look for, for novel ideas, solving big problems that's not already being solved somewhere else good enough. Now, I, I put up WhatsApp as an example of it. You don't always have to solve a problem that's not being solved. You know, texting, there were texting apps. There's, there were many, many texting apps that were competing with WhatsApp. They were successful because they really focused on solving international uh, you know, texting issues, and they just made an amazing product that truly was a thousand times better than anything else out there. So you can succeed that way too. It's just harder. So vision worth fighting for. That's the starting point. The next thing obviously is the founding team, right? So who is going to actually accomplish this? Um, 
and one of the things that, you know, and this is, you, you probably heard, you know, the hacker designer hustler. We like to look at that. And as an example, at Bebo, you know, when I met Michael and Sochi Birch, they really fit that great, both um, great designers, um, engineers. And I came along and helped on sort of the strategy, biz dev, fundraising. Um, so we were, you know, sort of a good fit. The one thing I do want to emphasize is, um, Generally speaking at Maven, we won't invest unless there's a technical lead. If the founder and CEO is not actually building the product and coding the product, uh, then we always look for the co-founder to have those skill sets. And you know, sometimes we'll find a, a team or a founder that doesn't have the skill sets and we'll help them find the, that co-founder. It's, it's not really ideal because we love finding teams that know each other, that have already worked together, that trust each other. Whether it was a college or grad school or have done a, a startup in the previous life, those teams have more likelihood to, to succeed. It doesn't mean that it's, you're not going to be successful if you don't fit that. It's just you know one of our filters. So thing, the thing about consumer startups that people often forget is because they're consumer facing and they seem sort of very light touch, um, you don't really think about the technology as being a gating item. But it is, and I lived that experience at Friendster. I mean, one of the reasons Friendster failed is because we couldn't scale the product fast enough to the consumers coming in. And they gave the companies like MySpace and Facebook the opportunity to come in and take away our customers. It was a technology solution issue. So we're very focused on making sure that you have an incredibly strong technology team. So this is something that a lot of people don't talk, I don't think enough about in the Valley. One of our filters is culture. The, the truth is, even with a team of two or three founders, and generally, you know, if you have four to six people, you have a culture in the company. And we find that it's very powerful and important to think about that culture and write it down. And I'll give you an example of what we mean. So at Maven, we did the same thing. It was it's just two of us, um, but we have a culture in our, in our company and we have a mission. And that's our mission. And their culture is, we wanted to list the five values that, that sort of uh, talk about who we are and what's important to us. So why do we do that? We're doing that just so we're on, Sarah and I are on the same page. We're also doing that as, as we hire new people, we're gonna hire for those values. We're gonna look to make sure that the, the next person that comes in to the small team will fit in with us on the values before we get excited about their skill set. And that's the same thing for startups. We often see startups that are gonna hire the first or second or fourth engineer and they're just thrilled, like this is the perfect person who's gonna you know, build our app for us. Turns out, like, nobody likes that person <laughs> and, and, or they, they don't fit into the culture for some reason. And that's actually gonna create more problems for you than that person is gonna solve on the technical, on the technical side. And you're gonna end up spending months trying to figure out how do we get rid of that person. So solve this problem first by writing down your culture and making sure that everyone on the team agrees to that, and then hire for culture first before technical skills. Then we talk a lot about product market fit. And by the way, if you guys have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and interrupt as we go along. I will hopefully, I should have some time after yeah, at the end. Uh, I might have mentioned this one. Let me, yeah, let me, let me just keep going though, for, okay. So um, product market fit and consumer growth hacking. So one of the things that Maven Ventures um, that's critical for us is we look for companies that can scale to tens of millions of people, right? We're solving problems for big market opportunities. So we talk a lot about hyper growth and, and viral marketing and growth hacking within our, uh, within our companies at Maven. One of the things that you should understand before you think about the growth hacking is to make sure that you have a product market fit. You don't want to necessarily scale something that's not really resonating with your consumer base, okay? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about growth hacking here and I can talk more about it in Q&A. The one thing that you should know about the growth hacking is there really is no silver bullet. There's not one thing, like people always say, well, what worked at Bebo that didn't work at Friendster? How did you grow to 50 million customers? How do you get 350 million customers you know, on Tango? You know, there, there are some techniques that do work cross-platform. There are channels that will work for most companies, but there's not necessarily one silver bullet. And really what it is is it's a discipline. Right? It's creating a culture within your company from day one about that growth hacking is important. The, at, at, B, at Maven, what we say is that consumer growth is really the lifeblood of these businesses. And so from the CEO down to everybody in the company, everyone should be thinking about how do we do growth hacking? How do we grow the consumer base? And then ideally, you have someone on the team who is in charge of that, whether they're called a growth hacker or they're an engineer, they're focused every day, you know, how do we grow, how do we grow this, 
these numbers? How do we grow the consumer base, the top line numbers? Um, I don't want to get into great detail on the, on the growth hacking piece of it, but we can as in the QA. One of the things that um, we spend a lot of time also with our uh, startups, and it's not necessarily intuitive for a lot of um, tech companies in the Valley, is this notion of language market fit. Uh, for a consumer product in particular, it's just as important to get language market fit as is a product market fit. So what do we mean? Especially with companies that are novel, that are bringing something new to the world, you have to be able to describe it very quickly in a few words. So when someone comes to the, to the app or your website, explores this product for the first time, it's clear to them what this is for, what this is about. And most companies, especially engineering run companies, either don't have the skill sets or don't even think that this is an important issue. It's actually absolutely critical to the point of what do you call your product and what is your tagline and what's the first words that the consumer sees when they come to your product. Those are absolutely critical. We spend sometimes months figuring that out and getting that right. The other thing that's really powerful is once you figure that out and you actually can talk about your product in a very powerful way, you use the same language for your PR and marketing. Right? So everything flows. So when you're talking to the press, you're using the same language to reinforce what it is that consumers are going to be doing on your product. We actually we spend a lot of time with that. We have a couple of uh, PR marketing firms that we work with very closely um, that we refer, you know, work with all of our startups. Um, it's something that you should be thinking a lot about as you're building your startup, especially on the consumer side. This, this issue comes up daily. You know, again, we, we'll probably speak with five to ten companies a week, uh, you know, face-to-face -face meetings and maybe a dozen more via email. And one of the problems that we see, especially on the consumer side, is a lot of uh, entrepreneurs will come in and say, I've got this great, amazing B2C idea, you know, direct-to-consumer idea, but I'm also going to be doing this kind of B2B and B2B2C at the same time. And, you know, the, the truth is, I can't tell you, you know, which is the right answer. Should you focus on the enterprise piece? Should you focus on the consumer piece? Should you try and do both? One thing I will say is you're most likely, I mean, 99% going to fail if you try and do both. Okay? So I just say choose one. If you really are passionate and it's, it's a great idea on the B2C side and, I, and I, it resonates with me, I'll try to encourage you to actually pursue that and then maybe help you bring in an incubator. We'll fund you. Um, if you're on the fence or if you're really more comfortable building an enterprise company, start there, right? Just focus though. Focus, focus, focus. It's so critical. So the other thing to think about is, you know, the, uh, the, the next question always is, well, I don't know which one should I choose. So, you know, I can't tell you that, but go with your passion, go with what your gut's saying. And if, if you don't, if it doesn't look like it's being successful, you know, if it's not really getting any traction, you know, hopefully you have enough time to pivot. So it's not the end of the world. Just, but the, the most important thing is to choose and focus on one. The other thing I put up here is just to briefly talk about revenue. Look, I mean, at the end of the day, we're building successful companies that will have a big revenue model, have a big business model. We'll be making a lot of money. That's what you know, these successful companies do. But one of the things that we, we do at Maven is we're not focused on that for the first year or two. right? We want to make sure we have product market fit, that we get traction, that we can do hyper growth, we can get to tens of millions of customers, and then have the revenue model kick in. That's the kind of companies that we like to build. I'm the classic, you know, Instagram acquired for a billion dollars without any revenue. But look at it today. Look at, I mean, people are saying that was one of the best acquisitions ever. YouTube losing so much money when Google acquired it for the 1.8 billion, maybe the greatest acquisition ever. Those companies, as they reach massive scale, have massive revenue opportunities. So the, the, the point here is when do you focus on the revenue, right? And for us, it, you know, it's not too soon. Right? So the thing about it is you're going to have four, five, six engineers, and if you're trying to build out this big revenue model at the same time of the growth model, you're not going to do either well. So we want to focus on the top line growth, product market fit, get, you know, making sure that you're delighting your customers. They have an amazing experience. Then a year, two, or three years down the road, we'll focus on the revenue model. That's, that's for us. That's not necessarily good advice necessarily for enterprise companies or other consumer companies. Um, one thing uh, that happens quite often, and I actually at one of the previous talks this came up, someone asked the question, I have a lot of advisors, help me manage them. What do I, I'm getting conflicting advice. Very common problem, especially, it's, it's happening even more and more now because we have more and more successful entrepreneurs who are becoming angel investors who are, or advisors and who, who want to give back. 
And, and the, the truth is, I think, you know, I, and when I was an angel investor and advisor, I was, uh, I, and I still am active with about seven different incubators and accelerators in the Valley, in the East Bay, and, and you know, San Francisco. Um, and I do it just to give back. And now I'm doing it also to, to potentially find some, you know, new companies to invest in. But we all have good intentions. Like, uh, we really want to help you. But the truth is, not everybody uh, has the right advice to give you. So you have to be very careful about who you're taking advice from, especially early on. Um, and I would say that if you're a consumer company and there's someone who's built an amazing enterprise business, you know, that was a massively successful revenue generating business, but has never done growth hacking or consumer, you know, you might want to be careful about taking their advice on, on language market fit, product market fit, right? Um, and so that's one piece of it. The other piece is how do you manage a group like if you have a group of advisors, one of the things that we encourage all of our companies to do is to actually put together maybe once a month or at least once every other month an advisory board meeting. And you'll selectively handpick one or two or three of those folks, bring them into this advisory board meeting and talk about whatever issues that are happening uh, in the company at that time and see if they can be helpful. So similarly, your investors, right? I mean, you're clearly, the most important thing you want to do at this stage if you're starting out is to raise money. You know, you need the money to achieve the next milestones. But just as important, you should think about, you know, can these people help us build the kind of company that we want to build? And if you're in a fortunate position where you can, you have multiple people who are interested in investing in your company, really think deeply about, is this the kind of person that I want to be, you know, either in board meetings or having them help out over the next two, three, four, five years or longer? And that's even a more important decision as you're looking at your Series A and Series B investors who are going to be putting in you know, millions of dollars and being on your board. It really is like uh, you know, a long-term relationship. Um, you probably are all familiar with AngelList. Uh, Gil was just talking about AngelList syndicates in the previous talk. We are um, you know, co-investors and we have a, a, a co-syndicate with them. Um, it's a, we have about $300,000 in the Maven Ventures Consumer Syndicate on AngelList. I won't go into great detail here, but I'm happy to talk more about how that works. Um, so, you know, if you're looking for seed investing, that's a great opportunity for you to, to uh, get your company on AngelList. You can raise money from investors from around the world now. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we do consumer investing, but you're, you should look for the kind of people and micro VCs and angel investors that can help with your particular business. Um, and so this is, this is the last slide and the, the, the last piece I'm not sure if it's advice, but maybe it's just the reality. Uh, look, a lot of this stuff comes down to, you know, luck, which uh, luck and timing. Um, and um, I'd say that, you know, I, I not the, the most successful companies I worked at weren't necessarily the the best team or the best idea, but it was great team, great idea. We executed on most of those nine other things I just talked about really well, but they were mostly very very lucky, right? And that's stuff that you can't necessarily control, but there is some sense of control. And I you know, put up here that the, really the harder you work, the more luck you will create. So if you're doing all those other things right, and you're keeping your eyes open for those amazing opportunities that could potentially be game changers, and most importantly, you take action to do something about it, you can create your own luck. And I'll just give you a, a couple of stories from Bebo, because that may have been the luckiest company I've worked at. And it was a great company, we were a great team, we had everything going. But early on, and we started scaling our social network in Europe. So we had a vision, which was, you know, Facebook and MySpace basically won in the U.S., but nobody was really growing uh, and uh, dominating over in Europe. And I knew that the European English-speaking market was just as valuable for advertisers as it is for the U.S. So we were like, let's get, let's dominate over in, you know, U.K., Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, which we did. And we grew incredibly quickly. Um, the problem was that as strict as uh, the uh, universities and especially high schools were in the U.S., they were 100 times more strict in the U.K. And we were getting these calls and notices you know, in, in uh, um, 2005 and six from principals like, we're shutting Bebo down in our, in, you know, in our school. You know, what you're doing is terrible for the kids. And we'd have these conversations with people that you, know, you can't just shut this down. This is the new reality. Let's work together to figure out how to make sure it's safe for the students and stuff. Um, and while that was happening, we were getting pressure from the government to basically shut us down, which would have killed the company. We got invited to be on the equivalent of the um, Good Morning America in, in the UK. And our founder and CEO is British, so we're like, this is awesome. So we 
you know, we jump on that opportunity. We thought, this is going to be great, get in front of everyone, get even more publicity. Um, and we, we were as prepared as we could be. Uh, unbeknownst to us, they also invited one other guest. And that was the head of security for, you know, national head of security in the, in the UK. And so she's on the show, and, um, and I'm watching from the back. And Michael's out there on the couch, and the, the um, you know, the announced the person who is the host was um, saying the first question, you know, was, um, so can you tell us just how bad Bebo is and how many, you know, students are getting harassed every day and, and how many pedophiles are on there? And, and Michael was just, just you know, sort of uh, easygoing guy. All of a sudden, was just like panicked. And, you know, we were, there was this silence and I was, my heart's pounding. I'm like, I have no idea what's going to happen. And, you know, we did our home, we were, you know, because of all those issues we had earlier with the principals, we actually were probably the safest, you know, social network, even much safer than Facebook and, and MySpace at the time because we had to be to survive. So fortunately, what she said was, actually, I was on the site last night and they do a really good job. It was, I mean, it was actually pretty safe. I, I didn't find anything glaring. And we're like, Phew, thank God. And the rest of the interview went great. As after the show, I, uh, we went and made her an offer, and uh, she joined our team as a head of security for Bebo. <laughs> so, you know, very lucky, but we took action. And then uh, a couple of months later, you know, we were off to the races. And then just a few months after that, we got acquired by AOL. So I have I'm many other... I'll tell you one other very quick story from, from Bebo. I guess this is unbelievable. So about six months before that, our site stopped working. And this was like... I had lived through this for a year with Friendster, and then I saw what happened with us with Facebook. Our site stopped working. Our databases didn't work. It, it would just shut down. We had that, like the fail whale kind of thing going on. Um, so fortunately, we were the only company still using Oracle Database at the time. We didn't use MySQL because we wanted to make sure that it was going to continue to work. And, and because of that, because we were literally the only like, new tech company that was still using Oracle, when I called my friend who was somewhat of a senior executive there, they took it very seriously. I mean, we were this like 12 person team, you know, we raised a little bit of money, but they took us really seriously, escalated up the chain. And within a couple hours, they said, there is a guy, there is one guy who knows how to fix your problem. He's an Oracle database expert. He moved to the UK. Here's his information. We're like, oh, this is unbelievable. We're going to get this thing fixed. Our site's going to be working. So we email him and amazing. He got back to us right away. And he's like, let me take a look. He took a look. He's like, I think I could fix it, but I'm too busy and you couldn't afford me anyway. We're like, what? <laughs> we were, I was literally ready to get on a plane to go fly out there, find, track down the guy, you know, he can fix it. And we were, we were literally up all night trying to figure out if we could, you know, fix this. We couldn't fix it. And then sometime, we're like four or five in the morning, people started working again. And so he, we gave him access to everything in case, I don't know, he was going to fix it. He ended up going in, fixing it, gave us the code. And it was working. So, like, we're amazed. And we call him up the next day or that morning, a couple hours later. And we're like, thank you so much. What happened? What changed your mind? He said, yeah. I, uh, next morning, um, I was telling my, my kids that, you know, some, some guys from Bebo called and, and said something about the base. And, and his daughter said, yeah, you know, we couldn't get on last night. And so, <laughs> what happened, Dad? He's like, well, I told him I don't have time. She's like, if you don't fix it, I'm leaving this family. <laughs> <laughs> like, unbelievable, right? You can't make that stuff up. And we got very lucky, but we did the hard work, right, to, to find that guy and to keep pushing. So hopefully you guys will have that kind of luck as you go along the path. Um, you know, there are things you can control, uh, which are the nine things that we talked about before. Um, and, you know, we're, Sarah and I will be here for a bit uh, after. We're happy to, to chat with you. We, we made this... This little slide here. This is our last. This is my last slide, um, because you know we we're happy to hear what you're working on and see if it's a good fit. But we're going to give you a little bit of homework, right? Try to think about now, you know, what your vision worth fighting for is, and tell us that in 30 seconds. You know, what problem are you solving? Why is it a big market opportunity? Why are you the right team? Um, who is the team? Is there a technical lead? And then, and really, we we can make this assessment. You know, hey, this is great. This is something we'd like to learn more about. Here's, you know, here's our information. We'll come in and, and, you know, we'll spend more time. Or it's not a good fit, and here's why. And we've seen 10 companies trying to do this and all that kind of stuff. So we'll, uh, we can wait, you know, outside or during the, the um, cocktail hour and happy to talk to you guys. Um, so with that, I am done with my formal presentation. If you guys have any questions, yeah. 
Um, I just uh, want to ask a technology, technology question. Sure. Because uh, most uh, venture firm here focus on technology. As we know, the, the most recent significant technology was the internet. The HTTP, www.com, World Wide Web, which was invented by an uh, English scientist, Tim Berners-Lee, 25 years ago. Uh, for the past 25 years, not just United, over the world, 70% might be more money go to dot com company. Today, still the same. So that's 25 years old. Before that, like uh, we have a flash memory, which uh, was adopted by Apple, and the flash memory, flash memory and the flash storage, which was made by Japanese in 1984. Mm -hmm. And after that, in 1988, there is another technology called a giant magnetic resistant uh, kind of like. You know, I'm not, I'm probably not the right guy to answer yeah, this question. question. So my question yeah. is. Uh, yeah. For past 30 years, we don't have any significant technology in the United States here. Yeah. You look at the rich people, idiots, idiots. Yeah. 76 million baby boomers, 50 years old. So my year to the VC is for past 15 years, hundreds of meetings. We should focus on technology. Right. Uh, if we do not know the technology there, it doesn't matter how much you so, invest. So I think I, I like would take... So, G3, yeah. G4, G5, so I think internet. this is an interesting, it's an interesting that's debate. That's debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it's an interesting debate. Yeah, and, I, and I've I heard... And there's, there are people who are saying... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, and this is actually a relevant... It's a relevant discussion actually to have for consumer startups. Because the question, the question really is... And this goes back to the vision worth fighting for. This might be a If you want to... Thank you. So look, then I, I, I'm not sure, what, what this, but I'll, I'll speak to a little bit of this because I think we, we hear a lot from consumer technology, you know, and this goes back to our original, uh, the thing that I was talking about, the vision worth fighting for. I, I, would, I would agree that there's a lot of consumer tech companies that are building stuff that we just don't need in this world. Uh, regardless of whether it's new technology or old technology, it's just there's great, amazing abilities and great minds that are frankly being wasted on just ridiculously silly ideas that could be hyper growth and potentially even very valuable businesses. But, but you know, it's not like something that we would be proud of bringing to the world. So I'll give you some examples of the companies that we are funding and give you a sense of the kind of businesses we do love. One of the companies that we helped incubate in our, in our comp uh, incubator is a company called Epic. Um, Epic is now, we started launching two years ago, but today it's now the largest platform for kids' ebooks. Why is that an important vision? Well, children are not reading paper books anymore. It's, it's something that we feel strongly about. We want kids to keep reading. They're spending all their time on the digital devices. So we took books and presented them in a beautifully formatted way that's easily accessible for kids. Five dollars a month, they have access to 50,000 books. Right? It's like a larger than any children's library in the world that happens to be a very profitable, great business as well, right? So those are the com kind of you know, companies we love. We also invest in a company called Cruise, building this incredible self-driving car technology. So self-driving cars is a little bit crazy, but it's a big idea. We are gonna live in our lifetime in a world where most cars will be self-driving. What does that mean? That means that there'll be less accidents, less traffic, less deaths on the freeway, more productivity, less stress. Those are, that's a big idea, right? And I'll give you one that, at first, bland, you know, uh, first blush, might not seem like a big idea, but actually is, and it's the reason why we invested. Uh, it's a company that we just announced yesterday raised their Series A, an $8.5 million Series A. It's a company called Shots. Shots is a selfie app. Does the world need another selfie app? When I first met with John and Sam, the founders, I'm like, oh, I'm not so sure. But it's interesting that Justin Bieber and Floyd Mayweather and some interesting people invest in this company. So we met a couple of times, and I was pulling out for them, like, why are you doing this? Why do they invest? Turns out there is a big idea here, which is most of these social apps for young adults are not healthy for the young adults. Why? There's bullying like you wouldn't believe. And you've read about probably uh, companies like Yik Yak and Secret where you know, teenagers are committing suicide because of the bullying. Even places like Instagram, which, which is a great product, and I love that, that product, but 40% of young girls are being bullied on Instagram f from friends and, and, and other, you know, call other uh, teenagers. We wanted to create a place that was just as an amazing experience as that, but safe, right? But of course, it's still cool and fun. And so that's what we did with Shots. So there's, the way we built the product, there's no bullying. It's all positive. And that's a big vision, right? So we went from a couple hundred thousand shoddies when we met with them 
to a year later, we have now over five million shoddies growing like crazy, raising eight and a half million. But we're really proud of, a, of, of that business because it's creating a place for people like my daughter, who's 13, to have a place where they can be self-expressive without the fear of being bullied. So that gives you kind of a sense of the kind of companies we work on. Yeah. So one of the things that you, you can get a lot of data on um, AngelList right now with where, you know, where the you know, valuations are based on how many people are in the company, what stage they're at. Um, we don't look, the, the, the truth is we, we, we care about the you know, valuation um, to some extent, but that's not really a, a, a guiding point for us. Um, you know, in a lot of respects, we're on both sides. If we're, an incu if we're incubating your company, we'll have shares of your business like we're a shareholder. We're almost a team member as well as an investor. So we'll work with you on figuring out what the right kind of valuation is based on the vision, the team, where the, where the current product is. Um, so I, I think there's some, I'll give you some metrics, right? If, if it's a new idea and a relatively new team, but, but potentially, but a really good strong team, but a potentially very big idea, that could be anywhere from like a four to six million dollar valuation, raising like about a million dollars, roughly, right? Um, let's say you've, you know, you're a team of four, you've built the product, you've got traction. I mean, you've got a couple hundred thousand people, uh, you know, customers, and it looks like things are going pretty well, but you're kind of, you're not sure how to take it to the next step, right? That might be a 10 to 12 million dollar valuation or more. Um, you know, Ariel earlier mentioned like if you, have some traction and you've got a good team and you've been through you know, a YC program, what you're seeing there is like anywhere from an eight to 10 kind of valuation. There's a little bit of a, of a, a branding um, spike, if you will, because a lot of investors are kind of putting the, so, so I, I find that the, the entrepreneurs that spend too much time on the valuation piece are spending the time in the wrong place. You know, things come together quickly um, if you're giving up 10% or 20%, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it doesn't really, it, it's not going to really matter that much. If you have the right people that can help you build a very, very big business, you know, sure, you don't want to be stupid about giving up too much equity and control, but that's not the key point. Any other um, questions? Concerns? Yeah. yeah, I noticed a lot of the unicorns you were talking about are kind of chat communication apps between people. Mm -hmm. Socialization. Um, how about the retail space or yeah. e-commerce space? Which ones do you, do you really like, and what's, what is it about them that you like? So it's a good question. So um, you know, we we love viral businesses uh, where you can c acquire customers for free without having to pay. And so one of the challenges of the e-commerce business is that generally, you know, you you can you know you can make ten dollars on that customer, so you have a five dollar customer acquisition cost. Um, and it's just a little bit of a different model. With that said, we've looked at quite a few. Um, what we we're, we're looking for is that the, the sort of commerce play where it's social as well. So I, look, I, I looked at Pinterest. Unfortunately, I, when I, by the time I got there, it was a pretty high valuation. But that's the kind of company like a commerce play that we would be very interested in or, you know, Wanilo or something like that. Um, we're talking to a company now that's doing something very interesting. They're, they're building, they have a technology that uh, enables you to try on clothes, um, you know, in the virtual world with like instantly and it works. And that's actually an interesting idea because that can lead to sales, but it's also a very social potential, you know, maybe even a communication kind of app as well as a commerce app. Um, we haven't done anything, you know, in that space yet. But we do. We have been doing some more marketplace deals. So I should say, um, marketplaces, you know, where you have two sides, uh, you know, are more challenging to build. Like it's with shots, we've got a product. We're looking to acquire customers. The average customer is a 16-year-old teenager. You know, we know what that business is. We got one platform to grow uh, and to build. With a marketplace, one of our companies is called Neighborly. Um, if you saw those guys, but it's, it's a really interesting idea, which is going to be a marketplace for buying municipal bonds. It's, well, it's interesting. You think about it. Well, you know, hmm. 
why don't we do like, you know, why doesn't that exist? Well, it kind of couldn't exist until today, but now that we're comfortable with like angel lists of the world, where people are investing on a marketplace, then that creates an opportunity for something like a, a muni bond marketplace where well, when you look at muni bonds actually with angelish and, I, and we're an investor angel so I love them and it's going to be a multi-billion dollar company but you have to be an accredited investor to buy an angelist with neighborly anybody can buy a muni bond an angelist 90 percent of those companies are going to go out of business so your investment is most likely going to fail with muni bonds 99 percent or 99.9 percent .9 will succeed you'll get your money back and make money on it yeah, and not only that, the, the really powerful vision that we saw with Neighborly, this is why we love this business, on top of the, we think it's going to be a great business, you actually can build your local community. So like what we used to do, we went and build the Golden Gate Bridge, we would go out to the local community, get bonds, buy, build a bridge. You want to buy, build a local school in Oakland, you can put, you know, the city can put a muni bond offering on Neighborly. Local community members can go buy that bond, make money over five years, and be proud of the school that you just built. That's a, that's a pretty big vision. So companies like that will we'll work on, it's not commerce per se, but it's a marketplace idea. Um, so we, and we're doing a little bit more in that space too. So Any, big yeah. thank you for um, thank you.